You see, there are breaking India forces at work that do want to break up India. They are not as such America or China. You see, they just take reality as it comes. And so, if there is an India here, in this part of the world, well, that's what they deal with. And so they don't specifically support separatism. They don't support separatism in Spain, you know, in favor of Catalonia. Uh, you know, but if Catalonia manages to become independent, then they will just no notice and adapt their diplomacy accordingly. So in the case of India too, you know, it's not so much a matter of other countries. Not even, well, yeah, Pakistan, that's a different matter. Mm -hmm. Pakistan has an interest in making India weak, mm. uh, not necessarily dividing it, you know, keeping it bleeding by hundreds of cuts, as uh, one of the Pakistani leaders said. That is already something, of course. And so all this terrorism against India, that's part of a strategy of keeping India weak. Um, other forces are probably even more ambitious. You see, you have all these NGOs, all these non-governmental organizations, often uh, Christian uh, or uh, motivated by so-called human rights. Um, and so they are very much uh, working against India and trying to divide India or trying to make pieces of it independent. Dravidas town in the south and getting Kashmir out of India and uh, uh, some of the northeastern states and so on. Uh, then as for Islam, well, it's not against India. With partitioning India in 1947, it has of course succeeded in acquiring a part of the subcontinent at the time when Islam was only 24% of the population here. So that's already good. But you see, they've also learned that this has divided the Muslims. And so maybe that was not the best strategy, looking backwards. I mean, all the best parts of India have gone to the Indian Republic. And so they, they have the leftovers. And, um, and then India is administered relatively well. I mean, I don't want to make publicity for all the babus in the Indian administration or so. But nevertheless, you see, there is freedom, there is lots of private initiative that is going well. Um, socialism has, you know, ensured a long stand still economically of India. Mm -hmm. India was for a long time uh, a proverbial synonym with poverty, right. like the time of Mother Teresa, yeah. you know. Uh, but that's no longer the case, no. you see. The liberalization has sufficiently released the energies of the Indian people so that there's plenty of entrepreneurship, plenty of things are happening, there's plenty of progress. Um, so that's good, but you see socialism has also ensured a measure of necessary reform. And I'm not at all holding a brief for socialism in general. Nevertheless, the fact that there was land reform, that um, there was social reform, that there was access to uh, land uh, property, to uh, education and so on for formerly untouchable castes. You see, this, this, this desire for social reform by which India distinguishes itself from Pakistan, which is still a feudal medieval state, you know, that is beneficial. I am, I am rather in favor of that. So India is a pretty progressive country in the good sense of the word. <clears throat> Um, nevertheless, you see, the, uh, all these NGOs are pushing uh, human rights uh, precisely in those points where they can use them to uh, put Hindus in the dock, you see. To, uh, like, for instance, the Nirbhaya case. Uh, this, you know, before that, India was known as a poor country, as a, a country with a very unpleasant bureaucracy and so on. But nevertheless, an extremely interesting country. People love to come here. Uh, nowadays, I hear many lady friends say, yeah, but India, yeah, that's so dangerous for women, you see, with all this rape culture. You know, 
the, the, these cases of rape have been enormously promoted, have been given enormous front page coverage. And so by now, they, they are part of the image of India. And, and wrongly so, I mean, what rape cases have taken place in Pakistan? You know, do you know? I mean, in Belgium, at such a distance, I never read anything about rape cases in Pakistan or in Australia or in China or wherever. You see, when in India something happens and they bring it to the front page in the West, that means there's an agenda behind it. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily of that Western newspaper. Usually they don't know what is going on in India. But you see, in India they've promoted it, they've posited it in such a way as to be an attack on, on Hinduism, on native culture. And then it becomes a little bit interesting. And then they start taking it over. And then it takes on a life of its own. And then ultimately it starts making the image of India. And so that's where we are now. You can see the what Rajiv Malhotra calls the breaking India forces, you know, active enough to, you know, to blacken India. And so that is that is very much going on. It's a different kind of blackening than 50 years ago, but it's there. And so now the second part of your question, <clears throat> well, you have to counter all that. And so um, I do not have a a fantastically uh, uh, clever strategy for that. And the first thing to do is to just oppose it, to resist it, and to answer it. You see, when whenever you see that kind of attack on, on Hinduism, on Hindu culture, on, on native culture in general, in newspapers, on TV programs, you react against it. That's the, that's the first thing everybody can do. Mm. Then... Um, to some extent, of course, this is also something that only a government can do. Mm -hmm. Namely, uh, to, for example, nominate the right people in positions of responsibility, nominate vice chancellors in universities, for instance, nominate people in charge of news programs and so on, to, uh, to counter this systematic uh, Breaking India campaign. Um, but there, you see, I, I find the BJP government doing very little, uh, understanding very little of what it's all about, probably because of an inferiority complex. Like, they, they borrow many concepts from the secularists. Like, they have this idea that Hindus are a naturally overbearing majority that has to be kept in check, like a dangerous dog has to be kept in his cage, uh, and, you know. And, and so, yeah, I mean, many people who are nominally Hindu or Hindutva nevertheless have interiorized those assumptions. And so that's why they, they are slow in encountering it. Um, so inferiority complex is one thing. Another is simply that they don't care. Now in the BJP, many people have joined it who have no ideological interest in it at all, who simply want to be on the winning side. And they get positions of responsibility, which from the old guard I find irresponsible, that they give positions of responsibility to just interlopers. Um, so, and then those people are ideologically uninterested. Then you have people who, well, have have other interests, you see, like many people want economic reform. And so they ha don't have the right to security concerns, to cultural concerns and so on. Uh, so that, that too is part of the problem. So in all those cases, what you need is to activate them, to make them more conscious, more aware of the importance of this. For that, again, there is no magic formula. Here I am reminded of what Ram Swarup said. <coughs> Namely, that uh, to light a candle, what you can use is another already burning candle. And so from candle to candle, you pass on the light. And so in that sense, you see, you, you just have to work everywhere where you are, where you encounter fellow human beings, and you spread consciousness. That's very important because if people don't know what they're doing, they're not going to do much or not going to achieve much.